Hello, and welcome to Rethinking U.S.-Russian Nuclear Arms Control. This is the third and final symposium in the Viktor Radovich Memorial Symposium series. My name is Chris Addison. I'm a senior project lead in the Technology Innovation Division here at CRDF Global. Just a few logistical items before we begin. If you have any questions for speakers at any time, please enter them in the Q&A box as opposed to the chat box at the bottom of your screen. We will have plenty of time for Q&A following the panel discussion. If there are any technical questions or issues, message me directly by using the chat feature and selecting my name from the list of panelists. Lastly, this event will be recorded and placed on CRDF Global's website in the coming days. I would like to now turn over to Gerson Schur, who will introduce himself and provide opening remarks. Gerson, you're on mute currently. Gerson, you're still on mute. Here we are. There you go. Okay. Sorry for that, folks. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are. It's a pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the organizing committee to the third symposium uh, in our series dedicated to the memory of Viktor Rabinovich. Our general topic today is science for global security. And our very distinguished speaker is Rose Gottemuller, the former Deputy Secretary General of NATO and before that, Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and Disarmament. Her discussion paper is entitled Rethinking U.S.-Russian Arms Control, and the topic could not be more relevant to Vic's concerns that we all share, and the speaker could not be more appropriate. Before launching into our feature event, I'd like to take this opportunity to recap where we have been in this symposium series and where we're headed. Vic left us in July of 2019. That seems like ages ago, but just yesterday as well. A group of us quickly hatched an idea to hold a memorial event in his honor in June of 2020. We even got some funding and sponsorship. The National Academy of Sciences agreed to host the event in their space but the new coronavirus pandemic intervened to disrupt that narrative. Instead, we've been holding virtual seminars, online webinars, covering the three areas of Vic's career and impact. And we intended to feature those three uh, topics in separate panels during the event. Those are international science collaborations, science for international development, and today, science for global security. Throughout, the same speakers and panelists with whom we started nearly a year and a half ago have stuck with us. And we, the organizing committee and sponsors, are incredibly grateful to them. Our viewership has exceeded our expectations, at least geometrically. Today, we have 70 people online at this moment. Our viewership, uh, typically we have had a hundred or more registrants for each webinar and somewhere between 50 and 80 participants from over 22 countries on five continents. Such was Vic's global impact. In December of last year, we introduced a new element a competition for modest cash awards for young leaders in international scientific cooperation. Here, our intention is to recognize and encourage young scientists to identify and test new approaches, new frameworks, new methods to develop and implement international scientific cooperation in the very new times and conditions they have inherited from previous generations. The competition is open to international applicants within 10 years of their PhD. 
And while research may be a part of such projects, our intention is not to sponsor or fund research. That's way beyond our capabilities, but to explore ways in which the international framework of research can survive and thrive in our new world. We're already receiving applications and hope that each one of the viewers in today's webinar will spread the word in their networks and encourage their younger colleagues to consider applying. The link to the competition announcement is going to be in the chat box. Please copy it and use it. We could not have anticipated the turn of events that led to the virtual form of the seminar series, nor certainly the establishment of the award competition. We could not certainly have uh, anticipated the resulting volume of interest and engagement. So we are now daring to think ahead about how we might be able to continue and adapt all of this into some kind of sustained project, not only to perpetuate Victor Rabinovich's memory, but also his life's work and his hopes for international science that we all share. For that reason, we are asking each of you to think about the future as well. There have been three seminars so far. What other topics can we or should we cover? Surely the three seminars we've had so far, including this one, do not exhaust the possibilities. And while we have yet to be able to assess the results of our modest award competition, we launched it in the thought that it would address an unmet need, or at least one whose magnitude nobody had been able to anticipate, how to sustain international scientific cooperation in a world becoming more fragmented by the moment, and how especially to ensure that there are future generations of scientists whose international orientation and engagement is as vigorous as possible. These were questions that troubled Vic Rabinowicz deeply, well before our current crises. We can honor his memory by looking for practical solutions as he always did. Now, I'm, I'm sure I'm already running over my time limit, but there are two very uh, important things yet to do. The first is to thank and acknowledge our sponsors, the Richard Lounsbury Foundation, CRDF Global, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, and the many private uh, donors who have contributed. Thank you so much. And a special acknowledgement and thank you, uh, and so much more go out to Vic Rabinowicz's family who have been so supportive and indeed active participants in our work. In addition, I want to express my deep personal gratitude individually to the esteemed members of our organizing committee, whose wisdom and commitment have just been immeasurable. Alex Rabinowicz, Bill Coglazier, Kathy Campbell, Chris Addison, Harley Balzer, Irina Dejena, Janet Rabinowicz, Jesse Ausubel, John Bowright, John Hurley, John Slocum, Kenneth Benedict, Lauren Graham, Marilyn Pfeiffer, Marjorie Seneschal, Marjorie Rabinowicz, Sean Wheeler, and Tom Callahan. Thank you. It's become a, a custom in our um, series and very good one to take a few minutes to view a beautiful video about Vic that his family put together, narrated by his twin brother, Dr. Alexander Rabinowicz of Indiana University. That's what's up next. Thank you so much. And we hope that you enjoy the webinar and, uh, and stay safe and be well. Victor's mother and dad, Eugene and Anna Rabinowitz, were Russian emigres, actually our mom and dad, since we are twins. Vic was as caring and supportive a brother as one could possibly want. All of us, his devoted family, miss him and find inspiration in his memory every day. Fortunately, our mom and dad escaped Nazi Germany and settled in London in 1934. Here we are, Vic and I, in Golders Green at age three, Vic is on the right. 
My dad received a position at MIT on the eve of the war, another stroke of good fortune, and we moved to the United States in 1938. We finished grade school near Boston and high school at Uni High, a wonderful University of Illinois laboratory school. An extraordinarily large number of our classmates there went on to truly distinguish in Golders Green 3, receiving a lifelong achievement award from our alma mater. Our dad, the well-known physical chemist Eugene Rabinowitz, was the in initial inspiration for Vic's lifelong commitment to global scientific collaboration in the interests of world peace. Dad was a founding editor of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, and a founder and lifelong participant in the Pugwash International Conferences. Vic was on the Bolton board and a participant in Pugwash for many, many years. Here is Vic at an early Pugwash conference in 1963 in Dubrovnik, Yugoslavia, just a wonderful conference venue. Vic's responsibilities took him all over the globe. Only very rarely did our travels cross. Here is Vic with me and my wife, Janet, on Red Square in Moscow, where we were conducting research in January, 1964. Here's another great Pugwash conference venue, Vic in Venice in 1965. And here's Vic with the distinguished and courageous Soviet scientist Andrei Sakharov at a scientific conference in Vilnius, Lithuania. Here is Vic with Walter Rosenblith and Kenneth Pruitt in 1990 at an international development workshop in Atlanta. Throughout these years, Vic remained involved with Pugwash, as this 1994 photo of him at a Pugwash conference in Crete shows. For more than 25 years, Vic held top-level positions in programs on science, technology, and international development at the National Academy of Sciences National Research Council. In 1990, he became vice president for programs at the John D. and Carth Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, which became his home base for the remainder of his professional career. One of his prized achievements at the MacArthur Foundation was the creation of the MacArthur Moscow office. Here, he, here is Vic in 1996 with the very capable and wonderfully dedicated staff assembled at the Moscow office. And here is a shot of Vic at the Sakharov Museum in Nizhny Novgorod with Lauren Graham, today's presenter, and Marjorie Seneschal, a member of the organizing committee for the symposium. Vic remained fervently committed to developing programs for young Russian scholars during the remainder of his years at MacArthur and beyond. Here's Vic with the staff at the Moscow office in 2003. And here he is again in 2004 with the co-director of the Mos MacArthur office in Moscow, Tanya Zdanova. In 1943, our dad acquired a farm in the Green Mountains of Southern Vermont. Every summer in the intervening decades, our large family, though scattered around the country, has managed to gather there for at least a few wonderful weeks or months. Here's Vic with his wife, Marty, in front of the barn. As everybody who knew Vic was aware, he was endlessly devoted to family. 
Vic had three sons, all of them named after Russian czars. Here they are with Vic in 2009, Nikolai, Koya, uh, Peter, Pete, and Alexander, Sasha. Their mother, Vic's first wife, Ann Collins Rabinowitz, passed away in 1986. Here I am with Vic at the family farm in 2016. Here we are, two years later, in front of a sketch of our dad, drawn by Martel, the dear family friend and Chicago artist who conceived the Bulletin's doomsday clock. Along with caring for family, meeting and making new friends and building international bridges, High on Vic's list of life's pleasures were, uh, was partaking of fine vodka, food, and wine. Here he is with caviar appetizers, which he prepared. And finally, here is a portrait of Vic not long before his death. We, Vic. We all love and miss you every day. Wonderful. Thank you all once again for joining us. My name's John Slocum. I'm a member of the organizing committee for this uh, symposium. I'm an independent consultant and a non-resident senior fellow with the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. And I'm very pleased to be your moderator uh, for today's panel discussion with Rose Gottmuller. I'll introduce our panelists in just a few minutes, but I first wanted to say uh, a few words about my own relationship with Vic, whom I considered, as have all of us on the organizing committee, to be a mentor and a friend. I was trained as a political scientist and Russia specialist, and I worked for the MacArthur Foundation from 1997 to 2016. I came to MacArthur having been hired by another one of our panelists today, Kenneth Benedict, to work under her direction as program officer on the Foundation's initiative in the former Soviet Union and its research and writing grants competition. The first few years of my time at MacArthur coincided with the last years of Vic's tenure there as senior vice president, and within a year of my arrival, I began to work closely with him as the program officer for the program on basic research and higher education in Russia, or BRHE, which we heard more about in the first webinar of this series. Even after Vic left MacArthur, in, uh, I believe it was, was the year 2000, I continued working alongside him as a member of the um, Governor Council for the BRHE program as I became director of Russia's higher, uh, MacArthur's Higher Education Initiative in Russia. I thought the world of Vic, and, and while there's much, of course, that I could say about it, I'll, I'll keep it brief, and I just wanted to share two pieces of wisdom he imparted to me, and I suspect to many others as well. The first uh, came on one occasion when I was no doubt exuding anxiety over some long-forgotten program officer's conundrum. Um, I came into Vic's office to talk about it, and he calmed me down by reminding me, with his characteristic smile, that this work, the work we do, should be fun. While he meant it specifically in relation to MacArthur, I'm sure it was for Vic a near universal truth. And second, as Vic used to say, it's incredible what you can accomplish if you don't feel the need to take credit for it. With that, let me turn to introducing today's panel. I'll first introduce our three discussants and then our speaker. Our first discussant, who is also representing the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, one of the sponsors of this symposium, is Dr. Kenneth Benedict. Kenneth is lecturer at the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago and senior advisor to the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. From 2005 to 2015, she served as executive director and publisher of the Bulletin, the leading scholarly magazine about threats to humanity from nuclear weapons, climate change, and emerging technologies, and known for its doomsday clock. She publishes articles and gives media interviews about nuclear weapons and disarmament, nuclear power, and global governance. Like Vic, Kenneth is a friend and mentor 
from our time together at MacArthur. From 1991 to 2005, Kinnett was director of the, interna uh, the Program on International Peace and Security at the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, overseeing grant making on a broad international security agenda. She also directed a grant making initiative in Russia from 1992 to 2001, and an initiative on science, technology, and security from 2000 to 2005. Previously, she taught at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and at Rutgers University, New Brunswick, as assistant professor. She received her BA from Oberlin College and her PhD in political science from Stanford University. She serves as an advisor to the MacArthur Foundation and on the advisory council of the Stanley Foundation. She is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. I'd next like to introduce Dr. Stephen Miller. Steve is director of the International Security Program in the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. He also serves as editor-in-chief of the scholarly journal, International Security, and co-editor of the International Security Program's book series, BCSIA Studies in International Security, which is published by the MIT Press. Previously, he was Senior Research Fellow at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, SIPRI, in Stockholm, Sweden, and he taught Defense and Arms Control Studies in the Department of Political Science at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, where he has long been a member of and formerly chaired the Committee on International Security Studies. He is active in the Pugwash Conferences on Science and World Affairs, an international scholarly association based in Rome. He is co-chair of the U.S. Pugwash Committee, a member of the Council of International Pugwash, and chair of the Executive Committee of International Pugwash. Steve has written extensively on nuclear weapons issues, U.S. security policy, and U.S. foreign policy. Among the many books he has written or co-authored, the most recent is Meeting the Challenges of the New Nuclear Age, Nuclear Weapons in a Changing World Order, published in 2019. He is also the co-author of several reports on the Iran nuclear crisis and editor or co-editor of some two dozen other books. Our third discussant today is Dr. Alex Wellerstein who is Assistant Professor and Director of Science and Technology Studies at the Stevens Institute of Technology. Alex is a historian of science who specializes in the history of nuclear weapons. He has published numerous articles on nuclear history for both academic and general audiences. He has also published on the history of eugenics. He is the author of Restricted Data, the Nuclear Security Blog, and the creator of the Nuke Map, a popular nuclear weapons effects simulator. Alex's first book, Restricted Data, the History, of nuclear uh, the History of Nuclear Secrecy in the United States, is coming out this spring from the University of Chicago Press. Alex received his BA from the University of California, Berkeley, and his PhD in the History of Science from Harvard. And now, we're extraordinarily fortunate today to have with us all these panelists, but I want to give a special welcome to our speaker, Rose Gottmuller. Rose is the Frank E. and Arthur W. Payne Distinguished Lecturer at Stanford University's Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies and its Center for International Security and Cooperation. Before joining Stanford, Rose Gottmuller was the Deputy Secretary General of NATO from 2016 to 2019, where she helped to drive forward NATO's adaptation to new security challenges in Europe and in the fight against terrorism. Prior to NATO, she served for nearly five years as the Undersecretary for Arms Control and International Security at the U.S. Department of State, advising the Secretary of State on arms control, nonproliferation, and political military affairs. While Assistant Secretary of State for Arms Control, Verification, and Compliance in 2009 and 2010, she was the Chief U.S. Negotiator of the New Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, New START, with the Russia Federation. Prior to her government service, she was senior associate with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace with joint appointments to the Non-Proliferation and Russia programs. She served as director of the Carnegie Moscow Center from 2006 to 2008 and is currently a non-resident fellow in Carnegie's nuclear policy program. She is also a research fellow at the Hoover Institution. Rose will be speaking today on the topic of rethinking U.S.-Russian nuclear arms control, which is based on the article Rethinking Nuclear Arms Control, she recently published 
in the Washington Quarterly. After her presentation, which will last about 25 minutes, we'll hear from each of our discussants in turn for up to 10 minutes. We'll then open the floor to audience questions, which I invite you to submit via the Q&A function, which I believe is at the lower right-hand corner of your screen. A, finer, a final reminder that today's webinar is on the record and a recording will be made available on CRDF Global's website. However, if at any time any of our participants wish to take the discussion off the record, we will pause the recording. And now, without further delay, I welcome our speaker, Rose Gottmuller. Rose? Thank you very much, John. It's a great pleasure to be here and to see so many friends and colleagues uh, on the uh, list of participants. Welcome to all of you. It's, it's truly a pleasure. And uh, John, I just want to say, you know, that uh, that advice you got from Vic is, is advice I've always treasured too. That is, uh, there's no end to what you can get done if you don't get, care who takes the credit. I don't know if Vic originated it, but it's a very, very useful advice I've found. Before um, I start in talking about where we are with nuclear arms reduction, I would like to zero in on Vic Rabinowicz and the role that he and his fellow scientists have played in science diplomacy. Some of you may have seen my essay in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, which is one of our co-sponsors today. They recently published a special edition to celebrate the Bulletin's 75th anniversary. And I had the opportunity to comment there on the role of scientific diplomats or perhaps I should say diplomatic scientists. I focus the essay on the necessity of strong interdisciplinary cooperation in diplomacy. But today I would like to focus on the way in which many eminent scientists have left their laboratories or research benches to help diplomats control and limit nuclear and other weapons of mass destruction. I cite Einstein and his manifesto with Bertrand Russell which was one of the earliest statements of normative principles underlying nuclear arms control. Einstein and Russell were joined by many prominent scientists of their days, including among the signatories of their manifesto, a zoologist, just like Vic Rabinowitz. Victor Rabinowitz was a science diplomat through and through. He championed efforts to, at science diplomacy throughout his distinguished career. And I was so pleased to see the film today. Thank you very much to that, to the Rabinowicz family. It was wonderful to see uh, the photos starting in Golders Green and all the way through the time when I was working so closely with Vic and uh, the MacArthur office in Moscow. They were great friends and colleagues while I was director of the Carnegie Moscow Center. I also uh, want to wholeheartedly endorse the way in which CRDF Global and our other sponsor, our other sponsor today and its partners are fostering and mentoring the next generation of young scientists. So I want to refer you again to the Victor Rabinowicz Memorial Award for Young Leaders in International Science just announced. Uh, Gerson Shear has been uh, the one who put uh, the link up and I do urge everybody to advertise it to, to young colleagues and make sure they know about it. Let's do our best to attract the next generation of young scientists to step into the science diplomat role. Now let me turn to the matter at hand, the immediate fate of the New START Treaty and where we need to focus our efforts going forward. I will first bring you up to date on where New START extension stands and then turn to the future when we will have some very hard work to do. I want to emphasize today that I'm speaking for myself and these views uh, did appear first in my article in the Washington Quarterly, which uh, John Slocum just, just mentioned. I wanted to say first and foremost that the Trump administration made some important steps. The Trump administration is ending its time in office having finally agreed that New START should be extended, albeit by only one year, but this is an important step. The second important step that the Trump team took was to get the Russian Federation at the highest level, President Putin himself, to agree to a one-year freeze on all nuclear warheads. Although a unilateral freeze conducted in parallel is not adequate as an arms control measure, the US negotiators insisted that the two countries should work on measures to make it verifiable, thus turning it into a real arms control limit. I repeat once again that these are important steps that I believe the incoming Biden administration should pick up on. Of course, the Russians resisted the notion of rapidly agreeing to pursue a verification uh, program 
for this, uh, this freeze. And it's been my experience that they never like to buy a pig in a poke. That's a technical term. But I believe that they will be willing to work the issue of warhead verification over time. I've seen that in a number of uh, track two activities I've been involved in, some real interest and some discussions going on. Most importantly, I think their president agreed to begin the process of directly limiting warheads, one of the longest held goals of the nuclear arms control process, but one that has been too difficult to pursue because of the sensitivity of conducting monitoring in sensitive warhead facilities. Now I believe that the stage is set to begin exploring such monitoring measures, but it will take a long time. That is one reason why I thought it was impractical to extend the New START Treaty for only one year in the hope of getting a new treaty done in that time. New START itself took a year to complete from beginning to end, and it was entirely based on earlier models of nuclear arms control, not breaking any new ground uh, on something as difficult and sensitive as warhead verification. I would be very surprised if the United States and Russia could come to agreement on warhead monitoring measures in one year, and not only because of Russian sensitivities. We are concerned about the sensitive nature of our own warhead facilities and warhead storage facilities on the territories of our allies. To my mind, the most important thing for our two countries to do is to commit now to a serious process or however long it takes. If we finish in a year, great, but we should take the time that we need. There is some notion out there of trying to leverage not only the Russians, but our own bureaucracy by having a one-year extension to try to force the pace, as I understand it. The Russians have already put us on notice that they, don't, uh, that they will not be leveraged in this way. As Foreign Minister Lavrov said recently, they don't want the treaty more than we do. As for our own bureaucracy, the most important factor will be continual pressure from on high. If the Pentagon, for example, senses that the president is not really interested in further nuclear arms reduction, then they will turn to the many other priorities on their plate. Continual pressure on the New START delegation and the US interagency, including from President Obama himself, is what ensured that the New START treaty got done in a single year. The Russians had similar pressure on them from the Kremlin. The other important consideration concerning extension is our own national security. To my mind, this is the most important consideration. We are about to embark on a modernization of our nuclear forces that will stretch into this decade and beyond. At the same time, the Russians have pretty much completed their own modernization. Although they continue to build missiles to replace old ones, and as is well known, they test new kinds. The point is that the Russians have hot warhead and missile production lines, and we do not. If New START falls away and they are no longer limited, they have the potential to quickly outrun us in production of missiles and warheads and can quickly upload more warheads on their existing missiles. In other words, they would have a major jump on us, a significant head start in a nuclear arms race for our own national security. We need to ensure that this does not happen. We need to ensure a predictable environment for our own nuclear modernization and work hard over the next five years to ensure that new limits are in place by the time that an extended New START treaty goes out of force in 2026. And I do underscore my own support for that five-year extension, the full five years allowed by the treaty, an extension to February 5th of 2026. This nuclear predictability should be uppermost in anyone's mind, considering the extension question. As I mentioned earlier, you'll find these arguments in the article that I wrote for the Washington Quarterly in September, Rethinking US-Russian Nuclear Arms Control. I wrote of New START extension as the quickest arms control win for a new administration, but also advised seeking a new reduction modeled on the 2002 Moscow Treaty. In other words, the United States and Russia should negotiate lower numbers of delivery vehicles and warheads, inscribe them in a treaty, and allow that treaty to ride on the back of the New START Treaty, as the Moscow Treaty in 2002 rode on the back of START. In other words, the verification regime and the implementing measures served both treaties. 
Now I think this approach might be difficult to accomplish as a quick win, since any new reduction would have to go through a ratification process in the Senate, and the Senate has some healing work to do before the necessary bipartisanship would be there to give advice and consent to a treaty. I wanna underscore that I, I support continuing to work with the Senate on advice and consent processes. I do not want to abandon the notion of ratification of treaties because frankly, it's their constitutional, part of their constitutional responsibilities to give it advice and consent to the president uh, to ratify treaties. So I think we do not abandon, but I think you know, if you want to talk about a quick win, uh, perhaps now is not the moment. Thus, now I'm thinking about some unilateral measures, reductions undertaken by both Moscow and Washington in parallel. Before you scoff, consider this. When the New START data exchange last occurred in September 2020, aggregate numbers for delivery vehicles and warheads were already below the limits allowed by the treaty. There were 675 delivery vehicles for the US and 510 for the Russian Federation. The treaty allows 700. There were 1457 warheads for the US and 1447 for the Russian Federation. Uh, in the treaty, the limit on warheads is 1550. So perhaps two, the two sides could simply agree to stick to a number of deployed warheads approximately 100 below that allowed by New START, that is approximately 100 below 1550. It would not be a large or in fact legally binding reduction, but it would be a signal that the US and Russia intend to go lower than the New START numbers. This signal could be a big help as the TPNW, that is the ban treaty comes into force two days after uh, Biden will be taking office and as preparations speed up for the August 2021 NPT review conference. Okay, now let's turn to the future. My Washington Quarterly article talks about a medium term or middle distance during which we should negotiate a new nuclear arms reduction treaty to replace New START and directly limit warheads for the first time in a treaty. It also argues that we should start talking, including with the Chinese, about how to replace the INF Treaty. I'm not going to dwell on this medium term here, but I do invite your questions and comments about it during our discussion period. Instead, I'd like to focus on what we consider to be the longer term future, when some very difficult and complex work will have to be done to ensure that nuclear arms control processes are fit for purpose as more and more new technologies come into play. Technologies in the cyber realm and artificial intelligence have the potential to eclipse the almost 70 year old technologies such as ballistic missiles that are the backbone of our existing nuclear forces. The challenge to start with is rethinking monitoring and verification for nuclear weapons control. Here, the opportunities are great as the emergence of more and more capable sensing capability, in fact, ubiquitous sensing, means that no inch of the earth will go unmonitored. Satellite constellations, many of them launched by commercial companies, are ensuring that future. In this context, old tools of arms control, such as non-interference with national technical means, can take on new meaning in the form of greater capability to monitor. They can also take on more importance for newcomers to negotiated arms control, such as, as China, agreeing not to interfere with national technical means may be a way to enter the game without having to submit immediately to intrusive on-site inspection. As the national security value of arms control constraints becomes clearer to new, new entrants, they, I don't doubt, will become uh, readier to accept more intrusive on-site inspection measures. I will say that, um, People ask me, you know, have the Chinese ever agreed to non-interference with national technical means? The answer is yes. In their uh, agreement and signature of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, they agreed to non-interference with national technical means. The clear message from me to you is that arms control has a future, or rather three futures, immediate, medium term, and distant. We need to achieve some immediate successes and those we should keep simple and straightforward to accomplish quickly. We do not need to revolutionize what has worked. The medium term will require intense work to confront new and complex issues and bring them into new negotiations. 
a bellwether here will be implementing verifiable limits on all nuclear warheads. If we can succeed in that arena, then we will know that we can achieve success controlling smaller units of account, even those that are hidden from sight. The distant future requires patient study, hard work, and the embrace of new sensor technologies, but it is a prospect that can tr transform our notions of how to go about constraining nuclear weapons. It will be a revolution, but one that has the potential to keep nuclear weapons under control in the future, even as we move towards zero nuclear weapons. We always knew that the total elimination of nuclear weapons as called for in the Non-Proliferation Treaty would be a gargantuan monitoring task, but new technologies will give us the potential tools to tackle it. It's a tantalizing idea and a fascinating future. With that, uh, I'll close my remarks. I look very much forward to our discussion and uh, back over to you, John, for, uh, for comments. Thank you so much, Rose. Uh, wonderful set of comments this morning, and I do highly recommend both the Washington Quarterly piece and the Bulletin piece, which I believe the latter, which is open access, we'll, uh, we'll post in the chat uh, momentarily. Um, the remainder of the substantive portion of our webinar today will be taken up by comments from our three discussants, and then I do encourage uh, anyone who is uh, listening in on the webinar uh, to submit a question through the Q&A function. Um, I'm going to turn it over next uh, to Kenneth Benedict. Kenneth. Microphone. Thank you, John, for your introduction and for the opportunity to participate in this symposium in memory of Victor Rabinowicz. Before I comment on Rose's excellent paper, let me speak on behalf of one of the sponsors of the symposium, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, where, as you heard, I am now senior advisor and previously served as publisher and executive director. Uh, Victor was a life member of the Bulletin's board of sponsors and also served as chair of the Bulletin's board for several years. In fact, it was during his tenure as chair that he recruited me in 2005 to take on the leadership of the bulletin. He had championed the bulletin for many years before that, in part because he knew how much the world needed the information and debate found in its pages, and more than likely because his father, Eugene Rabinowicz, had been the founding editor of the bulletin in 1945. Science and international affairs were in Vic's DNA. In a way, the bulletin was a family affair, but as many of you know, those of us who counted as family, in Vic's view, were legion and spanned the globe. Victor was a tireless ambassador and promoter of the bulletin, and that's why we're so very proud to co-sponsor this symposium with the Lounsbury Foundation, with CRDF Global, and others as a way of remembering and honoring his remarkable legacy. Rose, thank you very much for your paper today and for setting a pragmatic agenda for future restraints on nuclear weapons that will bring us closer one day to a world where nuclear weapons are no longer a danger. Uh, negotiations with Russia on an extension of New START are key to the near-term bolstering of the arms control regime, but I dare say that negotiations with the Senate may be just as challenging. We are living through a very dangerous time for our democracy, and it will take enormous skill to wrangle our own government in this venture. Uh, in my own comments, I'd like to pick up on two aspects of your paper. Uh, the first is the role of scientists in nuclear arms control negotiations. And the second is the role of citizens in verification of treaties and agreements. In both of these, I'd also like to underscore the role of public knowledge that I believe must undergird progress on nuclear weapons issues. Both today and in your Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists article last December, you remind us of the part that scientists have played in initiating binational and international explorations of weapons limitations and the continuing role they must play in the future success of negotiations. From the 1963 Limited Test Ban Treaty to the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, to the START Treaty and New START, when, in which of course you were the lead negotiator, to the Iran Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, scientists have played a major role. Certainly, they have helped iron out technical details of agreements and treaties, 
But I would argue that as important is the fact that science is an international enterprise. Across national political borders, scientists share a set of values based in the use of evidence, the search for truth, trust in established methods of inquiry, and agreements on the facts that provide the common uh, basis for a common view of the world. The epistemic communities that arise from scientific pursuits provide the starting place for trust, a fundamental basis for successful negotiations. These scientific and trusting relationships can be and are too often challenged by national governments, as you suggest they are in Russia and China today, and yes, even in our own country. These challenges to scientific communication can make it much more difficult to foster the trust required for success in a range of fields, but especially in arms control. Of course, scientists have faced these challenges in the past. Uh, stories about FBI investigations of the scientists involved in the early days of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, of the Federation of American Scientists, and of the Pugwash conferences stories that have been passed down from the days of Victor's father, Eugene, remind us of the courage of those early atomic scientists. And while government scientists like Sig Egger and others have also demonstrated such courage, it's good to be reminded that challenging nuclear weapon states to lay down their arms is not for the faint of heart. Second, let me turn to your suggestions for citizen participation in verification of arms agreements. Many in the NGO community are heartened, uh, even delighted by your recognition of the positive role that those individuals and organizations have already played in monitoring activity in Russia, Iran, and North Korea. Given the technological advances that you referred to and public availability of geospatial imaging and electronic surveillance, there does seem to be a growing role for these non-governmental private organizations. And in fact, with support for workshops and convenings held by the Stanley Center of Muscatine, Iowa and others, these folks are beginning to reflect on some of the ethical dimensions and standards for evidence that this monitoring work must entail in order for it to be trusted. Furthermore, it's clear that this is an exciting area that's drawing young people into the nuclear security field um, of a uh, trend that we deeply encourage. Let me suggest that calls for citizen participation be expanded even further, however. Given the enormity of the decision to use nuclear weapons and the extraordinary and consequential effects of a failure of deterrence, of blundering into a nuclear war, as former Defense Secretary Bill Perry calls it, citizens deserve to be much better informed about our nuclear forces and about government's plans to use them. We are all in harm's way. And yet the vast majority of folks simply have no idea what they will be in for if things go badly. So and part of, of expanding citizen knowledge and participation, the partnership of scientists and citizens requires renewed cultivation, especially in the face of challenges to reason debate and the ubiquity of falsehoods and lies these days. Many experts, including some scientists, believe that nuclear weapons policy is too technical for most people to understand and suggest that there's little or no role for citizens in policymaking in this domain. Perhaps we should not be surprised then, as you've suggested, that congressional members lack the knowledge to ask questions and show relatively little interest in nuclear weapons policy. Policy choices, however, are often based on competing sets of values, as much as the de technical details of implementation. Some of us take issue then with attempts to exclude citizens, especially in a democratic society, from participating in the most consequential decisions a government can make, whether to threaten another country with massive destruction. And in fact, as you know, a small but growing group of congressional members led by Senator Ed Markey and Representative Ted Lieu, among others, proposed legislation that prohibits the president from launching nuclear weapons without a declaration of war from Congress, which is its constitutional responsibility. Still others like Senator Elizabeth Warren and Representative Adam Smith are challenging the sole authority of the president to use these weapons without consultation. <clears throat> Finally, a judicious piercing of the veil of secrecy surrounding nuclear weapons 
would help citizens feel included in national security policymaking. And trusting them with more information might in turn engender and build their trust in government institutions, a trust that has been sorely missing of late. Your call rose for citizens to participate in verification of arms limitation agreements comes as a welcome step in the direction of a better informed and active citizenry. It's also a most fitting way to honor the legacy of Viktor Rubinowicz as a sponsor and one time chair of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists and a very active participant in Pugwash. The founders of the Bulletin in particular knew how very important it was for the public to know about nuclear weapons and to understand the full dimensions of their development and use. Their democratic determination, as I call it, lives on in these science-based organizations and in your suggestions for citizen involvement in monitoring and verifying agreements of the great challenge that we have in our future. Thank you for your patience and listening to me and thank you Rose again for your very excellent paper uh, on the way we can move forward on new arms limitation agreements. Thank you, Kinnett, for your astute comments and uh, both on the role of citizen participation and also the call for an appreciation of empirical truth and, and science in an era when uh, we hear of uh, epistemic uh, crisis, uh, the call for uh, restoring uh, the the value of scientific uh, truth and understanding is is very timely. Um, Rose, with your permission, I'll, we'll hear from all the discussants, and then I'll give you an opportunity to uh, to respond before turning to uh, Q and A. Uh, we've already had uh, a question come in, and we invite more uh, from attendees to this webinar. But at this time, I would like to turn the floor over to Dr. Stephen Miller. Steve, please. Thank you, John. Uh, let me begin by uh, echoing the esteem that has already been expressed by others uh, toward uh, Victor Rubinowicz. Uh, I may have a particular uh, appreciation for his contributions because there has been a considerable overlap in the ways that he spent his professional life and, and realms in which I have devoted a lot of time. I've uh, been heavily active with the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, especially in recent years. And uh, as John mentioned in his nice introduction, uh, for some quarter of a century, I've been uh, deeply involved in, in Pugwash. So I share uh, many of the uh, sort of commitments that uh, Victor uh, gave a lifetime to, uh, makes me feel particularly privileged to participate in this event. Uh, turning to the substance, I'd start by uh, commending Rose's uh, Washington Quarterly paper to you because I think it's an especially uh, thoughtful and uh, insightful contribution to the discussion about the future uh, of arms control. And as uh, Rose laid out very articulately for us, she sketched out a vision here of a near term, medium term, and, and long term uh, future for arms control, but with an emphasis on sort of uh, gaining some near term. Uh, wins by a new start extension and possibly by uh, unilateral locking in of, of reduced uh, warhead numbers. Uh, we have the advantage in aiming for this quick win strategy that new start is already negotiated and ratified and therefore uh, it's simply a matter of making a policy choice in Moscow and, and Washington to uh, extend the treaty whether for one year or preferably for five. And as Rose's paper uh, lays out, uh, the harder challenge is uh, what's beyond new start? Where do we go? How do we build on the breathing room that a new start uh, extension uh, will uh, give us? To me, that res raise, <clears throat> raises a question of, uh, of thinking hard about uh, the impediments uh, to arms control, the problems we're going to have to, to surmount. Uh, Rose in her essay uh, emphasizes two. One is the uh, extreme partisanship that now attaches to uh, uh, arms control issues, uh, the polarization, uh, the, what she describes as arms control skepticism, 
Uh, she says arms control is under attack. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the history of arms control, arms control is always under attack. This started uh, during this, the SALT I negotiations in the early 1970s. Uh, and so one way of looking at it is that we've had a decades long battle between the proponents and opponents of arms control. The balance of power has fluctuated across time. But what one has to say is that uh, for much of the last 20 or 25 years, I would say starting with the defeat of the, the chemical weapons uh, convention in the late 1990s, uh, the skeptics have, have won more than their share of victories. There have been some ex important exceptions. And of course, Rose is associated with the, the most important exception, which is New Start. Uh, but otherwise, what we've seen is uh, you know, a lot of defeat and dismantlement, much more than uh, progress and, and momentum in arms control. And of course, uh, this is related uh, in part to divergent assessments of the utility and desirability of arms control. Rosa also emphasizes in uh, her essay that the Russians uh, have contributed to this skepticism by their sketchy compliance record. And in fact, uh, instances of non-compliance that, that make it very difficult for proponents of arms control on our side to fully defend the record or to promote this particular instance. All of this, of course, intersects with ideological predispositions. Uh, and there's a whole school of thought that we're all familiar with that associates arms control with weakness, with appeasement, with re rewarding bad guys and so on. Uh, and of course, there's a school of thought in our body politic that has a strong preference for aiming for coerced outcomes where we can get closer to the 100 to zero uh, results that, uh, that uh, would be uh, ideally obtained. So uh, the, the environment here, I would say over a very long sweep of time has been very challenging for arms control. On the other hand, new start shows that, that it is possible and that uh, one can in fact succeed in making significant steps. But there's other features of the current environment that seem to me to uh, be particularly uh, challenging as we enter a phase where we're essentially trying to restore arms control to a more prominent place as a useful instrument of policy and also trying to rebuild a circumstance of uh, a regulated nuclear environment. Uh, one is the, an obvious point is the decay of uh, great power relations. Uh, this not only reinforces the domestic skepticism because we really want to be doing business with these guys on their side, but it also inhibits the instinct to interact, uh, whether on their side or on ours. And of course, one of the uh, really important points about nuclear arms control or any arms control is that you need a willing party on the other side. The Russians have been willing, uh, expressed a willingness, as Rose points out, to extend to start but uh, their commitment to arms control in general, I think has been uneven across time and not always consistent or clear. Uh, then there's the fact that there are substantive divergent, uh, uh, divergent substantive uh, agendas once we get beyond New START. There are issues that they will wanna talk about that we won't, whether it's BMD or conventional strike or space weapons uh, in the Chinese uh, case, uh, their agenda for the moment seems to be avoiding getting drawn into the the arms control process uh, all altogether. Uh, then we have uh, a point that's lurking in, in uh, Rose's essay, uh, a significantly changing technological environment within which this is playing out. Rose, I think very importantly and very usefully emphasizes the positive potential of some of the technological advances for uh, enhancing uh, our ability to monitor and verify but of course, things like cyber and dual use and, and, and uh, new and different uh, delivery vehicles and so on poses real challenges for, for arms control. How do we account for them? Can, can we constrain them uh, further as, as quite a number of uh, nuclear wonks are now uh, fearing uh, advances in surveillance and accuracy and lethality are, are in fact undermining uh, the nuclear stability on which uh, we have uh, rested much of our uh, nuclear policy for and nuclear arms control policy in, uh, for much of the recent decades uh, because it looks 
increasingly likely that forces are going to be more vulnerable in the future. And all of this is playing out in the context of uh, robust nuclear modernization programs, basically on, on all sides. Uh, and then uh, we have arrived at a moment uh, as President-elect Biden uh, is about to assume office uh, where he is inheriting New Start accepted a very substantial dismantlement of the arms control infrastructure that was built up over a three or four uh, decade uh, period. And so we're starting to this reconstruction process uh, in an environment that is more unconstrained and more unregulated than at any time uh, in many years, several decades, including an atrophy of the process a demise of the epistemic uh, community that was uh, on the official side committed to and involved in arms control. And I would say that the cadre of experienced professional arms controllers who know one another and who know the history of these issues has uh, greatly diminished compared to what it was in the heyday of the strategic arms control process. Uh, and that, that's just another component, I think, of, of uh, the reconstruction uh, process. Uh, we really need a lot more Rose Gottmullers. Uh, and she's, as we all know, a rare commodity. Well, in this kind of environment, uh, it's a pretty substantial uphill climb to make uh, significant progress in arms control. And so I'll close my uh, uh, last minute with just uh, a few quick thoughts on uh, in a context like this that is so difficult, how can we mobilize within the United States a game-winning coalition for arms control? And uh, to me, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, an obvious uh, proposition, if you are familiar with the history of treaty-based uh, arms control in the United States, uh, the single most useful factor is to have a Republican president. <laughs> uh, Trump, of course, is an exception to this, but uh, for the rest of the history of bilateral nuclear arms control, uh, it's been overwhelmingly uh, a Republican exercise uh, with the single exception of the obama Gottmuller New START experience. Uh, and the explanation for this is obvious that when a Republican president promotes arms control, the Republicans go along and the Democrats are willing to support. When a Democrat tries to do arms control, the Republicans oppose. And that uh, that's a point that, that overlaps with uh, Rose's uh, proposition about the partisanship associated with this. Uh, the support of the military is very important. And here I would draw attention to the uh, very uh, insightful comments Rose makes in her paper and in her remarks about arms control as a planning mechanism, as a device that pr allows predictability and modernization, that is to say, this is an asset in our defense policy planning uh, that it, it, when it is useful for the military, you then have a very potent ally in, in playing the, the domestic politics of, of arms control. Uh, an important dimension uh, in most of the history of uh, strategic arms control has been a real concern about the other side's buildup and fears that, that at least temporarily they're gaining some sort of advantage compared to us. Uh, this is of course counterposed to those who believe that our best strategy is to arms race the other side into oblivion. Uh, but here, I think Rose's point about Russia's hot production lines and the fact that our modernization programs are not actually in, in sort of harmonious phase may be an advantageous from the point of view of building a, a a winning uh, coalition. Then of course there's internal bargaining and I think the Obama administration did very well at this, but basically for the skeptics of arms control up on the hill, uh, the arms control ratification process is a very large piece of leverage that enables them to bargain for things that they want, mostly commitments uh, to uh, modernization and generous funding for our, own, for our own capabilities. And the last thing that leaps out at me looking uh, at the uh, sort of broad sweep of these kinds of uh, negotiations. And it's a point that I think uh, intersects with uh, some of Rose's observations is that uh, through much of the history of uh, strategic arms control, there has been an effort to be inclusive 
in the direction of Congress to form committees of people who were consulted or invited to observe the negotiations or who were brought to uh, negotiating uh, sessions. Uh, Rose emphasizes the importance of education, persuasion, and persistence in reaching out to uh, particularly the key congressional uh, parties uh, who, who hold the fate of ratification in their hands. And I think this notion of being inclusive in the direction of congressional involvement may be a subset of that general instinct. And it may be that, that uh, some constellation of this set of factors would enable us uh, in this long-term battle between the proponents and opponents of arms control to allow the proponents to have a few more wins than has been evident in the last quarter century. I'll stop there. Thanks so much for allowing me to share some thoughts with you. Thank you so much, Steve, for your comments and the very clear way you've you've set forth some of the impediments to arms control and some of the, the, the ways of overcoming those. We've heard about citizen engagement. We've heard now about the role of Congress. Uh, we've heard a lot about epistemic communities today. So, Alex, I would be disappointed if those if that uh, concept didn't didn't uh, feature in your comments as well. Uh, please keep the uh, questions coming. We have several now in the queue, but we have time for uh, our, our third discussant, Alex Wellerstein. Alex, please. Thanks so much, John. I really just want to thank everybody, the organizers. And I'm very honored to be on this panel. I, I feel like I'm totally out of my league, which is great. It's a great feeling. Um, <laughs> I'm a historian. I am not somebody with any policy experience in that respect. I come at this not from the sort of perspective of somebody who's done any horse trading. Um, and, uh, and honestly, I know a lot more about things that are way in the past from these discussions than I do about, say, the Obama administration, things like that. I know a lot about the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, uh, even before what we tend to call arms control, but the sort of origins of these arguments and things like that. Um, I really enjoyed uh, Rose's paper. All of the recommendations sound reasonable to me, but I'm very easy to convince about these things because again, I don't uh, I don't have strong preconceptions, which is an important point, by the way, that my political scientist colleagues always emphasize. Uh, it's very hard to convince people if they already have a strong opinion on something. Uh, there are very few converts in this world. Um, it's much easier to convince people who don't have an opinion on something, which ties directly into these questions about uh, what do you do with the public? Um, how much can you or should you or need you engage them if the public are the fulcrum that moves the political apparatus and gets uh, senators and representatives who feel like they need to know about something and have an opinion. How do you get the public to have an opinion? Um, the, the downside at the moment is that they don't have much of an opinion on arms control. Most of the public does not understand any of these concepts. Uh, they, they understand the idea of disarmament. That's nice and simple. But when you're talking about how many warheads, and, and we're not just talking about the quote unquote, uneducated public. I, I teach students uh, every year who are undergraduates who are very uh, educated, you know, maybe not educated yet, but they're very intelligent. Uh, they're, they're interested in technical topics, they're engineers. Um, and you always have to start from the beginning. They, they have no exposure to this kind of uh, information. And that's both a, a, uh, a challenge and an opportunity. Uh, the challenge is of course, you've got to build it up, but the opportunity is that they don't have a preconception. They don't have views on arms control, except for a sort of generalized, and this might be my particular demographic, but a generalized suspicion that you can use negotiations. Uh, and I don't think that that comes from any particular political ideology. I think it comes from watching perhaps too much History Channel or something like that, but, but a sort of general sense that, you know, peace through strength or something like that is, is an, an acceptable philosophy. And it takes a lot of work to sort of get them to see that a negotiation uh, is, is sometimes the, the, the better approach. Um, I had a few thoughts in, in thinking about this paper and these comments that um, have been coming in, some of which uh, said things I was thinking, so I won't repeat them. Um, uh, one of the things that Rose starts the paper off with, which is something that I spent a lot of time just thinking about over the last week or so, which is sort of, you know, what is the benefit of arms control and that we have to sort of keep this in mind. And Rose emphasizes that, of course, people who have been in this world a long time see it as sort of an obvious given and, and find it 
don't need to sort of reiterate it. Um, two of the examples that Rose gives is sort of the bedrock of arms control. One is uh, uh, there's a cost trade-off that if you don't spend money on arms, you can spend it on other things um, uh, that you can sort of allocate your resources better. Um, which I think is great, except for the fact that we still spend the money on the arms as far as I can see. We just spend them on different arms. Um, the, our military budget has been, in my opinion, obscenely high and uh, disproportionately high for quite a long time. So, uh, but, but I would love to take that money and put it into infrastructure and high-speed trains and healthcare and things like that. Though I don't know politically, that, that's a larger political question than arms control, obviously, is the allocation of the money. The other is national security, which is, um, an arms control treaty has to benefit national security in some way. And, and that's sort of the angle I wanted to prod on a little bit here. Um, who's national security? I mean, obviously the country, the United States, we're all Americans, that has to be in there too. But um, it, it feels to me like if an arms control treaty is gonna work, it also has to benefit the national security of the other country. And that's the part where I feel like sometimes the political ideologies get really crossed and get very complicated on. Uh, we don't really like to see ourselves in the business of benefiting Russian national security or Chinese national security. But if we want the Russians or the Chinese, especially the Chinese, uh, the, uh, assuming the desire to have the Chinese be involved in these is not just a poison pill, right? Uh, what's in it for them? And I think that, that that's something that I haven't seen a great answer to. Um, why on earth would they want to sign a treaty limiting their arms when they have so few arms? And, and Rose emphasizes this in the paper that, that, that this is going to be a stumbling block. But I really think that from first principles, if we do want to involve them, we really have to go about it as to thinking, well, what do we do for them? We know what it would do for us. That's pretty clear what limiting China's capabilities would do for the United States. It makes sense. Uh, but if it doesn't do something for them in some major way, I, I don't see why they would sign on to it. And it, it strikes me that this is the really difficult part about this is sort of empathizing with the other view. Um, I have a lot of discussions with people informally and online, uh, not part members of the policy community, just regular people. And, and they're often stunned that, you know, the Iran deal would be have to be sort of useful for Iran. I'm like, well, of course, why would they sign it if it wasn't useful for them? But to me, this is one of those public communities communication things that I think is, I think the people involved in this world know all these points very well um, and, and not only know them, but have interacted with these people. And this ties in with our epistemic communities and science diplomacy issue. This is one of the real benefits of Pugwash, of track two, uh, getting to feel like you're not dealing with a monolithic state on the other side, but actual people who have regular pe human interests, that you're not dealing with some sort of cartoonish version of, uh, of an evil doer over there. Uh, that, that all of this seems to be the struggle. And uh, when you try to translate that activity, not from that of the arms controllers in the room, who, who I know all know all this, but try to generalize that so that people can understand arms control. Um, uh, the other thoughts I had very briefly, because uh, I don't want to take up too much time, because I think the, the discussion will be more interesting than my comments. Um, uh, my perception is that the US, or at least those skeptical of arms control, uh, they seem to argue from a position of American insecurity. Uh, like we are vulnerable, we are under attack. And you know, for most of this history, the US has not been insecure. We've, if anything, been much more powerful and much more capable. And it, it leads to strange interpretations. I see people talking about Russian interest in tactical nuclear weapons, like this shows Russian aggression. And my, my read on tactical weapons as a historian is that they show that you're, you feel insecure, right? That you cannot counter a conventional force, thus you think you need this. That's why we had them against the Warsaw Pact, right? It, it it wasn't because we knew tactical weapons were great. It's because we didn't think we could take out all their tanks. And this is just a flippant perspective that I find interesting in talking with people about uh, to sort of put out there that we don't need to feel insecure. We have, we're the only sort of globally active military hegemonic power out there uh, uh, for all that it's gotten us. But, but, but I think we could come at this with a little more self-confidence and it would give us a little more flexibility. And I, there's a way in which I feel like that ought to appeal to the sort of ideology that's against arms control, the desire for American strength. We are strong, it's all right. I mean, maybe not always internally, but certainly when we, we have the ability to project power like, like nobody else does. Um, the other th question I had for Rose is, is, and this is about uh, internal 
intra-governmental uh, dealings. How do you deal with the fact that there's, there's clearly parts of the United States uh, government and, and military that benefit from the arms control, uh, arms races, excuse me, that benefit more from arms races than they do from arms control? How do you deal with that? I don't know, but there's clearly, you know, the military is, does not seem that interested in arms control at the moment when I see, have seen these generals give speeches and things like that. There's, there's almost a, a gleam in their eye when they talk about how, oh, China's doing this and then we're gonna do that and they'll probably respond to this. And, you know, like this is gonna be a very exciting opportunity for them professionally. And how, how do we balance these, these sort of forces? I don't know the answer. I'm really interested what others uh, happen. Last thought, and then I'm done. Um, uh, what happens if we fail? Um, this to me isn't in Rose's paper and is something I would, I would push communicators who are urging one path or another. What, what if it doesn't happen? What do we end up with? Um, obviously there's high expenses. Okay, we, we would have to match in some way. Uh, we could be at greater risk in some way if the Russians, as, as Rose emphasizes, uh, dial up that system and just pump out a lot more warheads. But I mean, come on, we still got a lot of warheads. But it's not like they're gonna nuke us, right? Uh, so, so what's the like end game? Is it just increased risk? Is it increased expense? But I, I think uh, potentially decline of influence if some of these treaties fail, we, we lose uh, opportunities to negotiate. Um, that's my, and maybe this is an ignorant read on, on the INF uh, ending, is that we, we sort of didn't gain anything from pulling out of the treaty and we lost an opportunity to sort of harass the Russians about their violating the treaty, which to me is, is a sort of loss of venue in a sense. But, but I think that emphasizing the costs of failure and not just, I mean, look, I'm the last person who says that you shouldn't just put up a big mushroom cloud in the background because like, it's like my whole website has a lot of mushroom clouds on it. But, but uh, uh, you know, other than, than that, like what are the realistic penalties for failure? Because if there isn't a sort of reason to say, look, you got to do this or there's going to be a problem, I, I think it's harder to get people to go down that line, especially if they're not already on board with it. Anyway, those are my comments. Thank you again. I'm really pleased to be here. Really excited to see where this goes. Really appreciate the paper, Rose, and uh, really appreciate the, the comments from uh, uh, Kinetics. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex, uh, for your provocative comments, for including the word epistemic, as, as uh, I encourage you to do. But um, in all seriousness, the, uh, the question of, you know, what is the value of negotiations? I think it's very important to, to hear through you the voices of, of a younger generation and their, and their views uh, which are skeptical not just of multilateralism, but of the whole concept of negotiation as it's been carried out in international affairs. Um, the one, if I can just add one substantive point to our discussion, the arena in which uh, a, a younger public is, is mobilized that is relevant, I think, to our topic today is climate. And I know that the bulletin has, uh, for some time now, expanded its scope from uh, nuclear security to include climate change uh, and other uh, existential threats. So I'm just, I'm just wondering, in the in the context of some of the previous comments, whether there are ways of, in 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 some sense, piggybacking on that awareness of climate, which is. Uh, front and center uh, for uh, a younger demographic in ways that, for those not old enough to remember the Cold War, uh, um, nuclear security issues may no longer be. So um, with that on the table, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to Rose for some reactions to our uh, excellent uh, panel of discussants. And then we do have a number of questions in the queue, and I think we'll have time to get uh, to all of them, I hope. Rose. Very good. Boy, that was a, a rich... Uh discussion series of comments, so um, I will do my best uh, to get at some of the major issues raised, but I'm not going to use epistemic um, be the outlier there. So, um, Actually, your last comment is really important because it's what I've been grappling with, how to draw in a younger generation, get them interested. By the way, later this morning here in California, I'm starting uh, my first class for a winter quarter course on uh, how to think about these problems of monitoring and verifying future arms control and, and non-proliferation treaties and agreements. And I'm hoping the young people in that class, and, and I do have some interested young people in that class, evidently I haven't met them yet, 
but I hope that they will help you know, me to think through some, some of these issues. But I wanted to begin by saying uh, and picking up on, on some points that Kanet made, it is really important, I think, to think, think about the crossover as the bulletin's been doing for some years now uh, between the um, existential crisis of climate change, the climate crisis, and the existential uh, threat of uh, nuclear conflagration, and how we bring those two together in a way that will help to grab the young people, I think is really, really important. And I don't have a good answer for that. And I'm glad that the bulletin continues uh, and its board continue to grapple with that set of problems. But I do want to say that uh, uh, Kanet brought up uh, the way getting young people interested can be done through the, the citizen participation. Uh, and for many, many years uh, in the environmental realm, there have been uh, you know, ways for citizens to participate in monitoring, for example, oil spills or monitoring die-offs of, uh, of sea creatures, uh, you know, these kinds of things. And scientists welcome the fact that data is being uh, supplied to them by citizens who are you know, picking up dead shellfish on beaches and, and things like that. So it's been long in existence and I've been thinking, 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 how can we now make this uh, uh, also relevant to, uh, to nuclear monitoring, nuclear verification. So it's a big change, but uh, as Kanet pointed out, it's already been happening in the way that we have you know, certain groups, and they are uh, mostly in non-governmental organizations, but certain groups using commercially available satellite imagery uh, and other, other kinds of, uh, of data to, to you know, come up with answers that uh, maybe uh, the more formal intelligence processes haven't been able to come up with. And just some of the organizations, uh, uh, Bellingcat is probably the most, uh, kind of exciting in many ways. They follow all kinds of things, but there's a lot of people doing, um, doing work on North Korea, like 38 North at, at the Stimson Center uh, is an example. That's Sig Hecker, of course, in the, in the work that he's been doing at Stanford. I, I'm not meaning to leave anybody out. I know uh, there's a lot of exciting work going on in this area, but Kanet talked about quality control, and that does concern me very, very much. And the standards of evidence this work that the Stanley Foundation has been doing, I fully endorse, and I hope that there will be more uh, thought given to that and more work done, because if we're going to have public participation, the evidentiary base has to be well supported. When I started down this road back in 2011 with uh, the Drell lecture at Stanford, and I, I gave a version of the lecture in uh, Moscow at Nagimo, <laughs> and the young students there listened with great interest, but then one of them raised his hand and said, how will you ever get my government to accept the authority of information coming in from you know, citizens? And won't it also be a danger to those citizens participating in this effort? So there's a whole host of questions, both around standards of evidence and in some systems also uh, the safety of those participating in an evidentiary process. So, I think, uh, again, Stanley's doing great work on that, and I, I'd love to see more of it. I'd love to see more organizations involved in, in thinking through this set of questions. For Steve, you know, I, I wanted to say, I've just finished, I, I just actually yesterday sent to the publisher my, my New START memoir that will come out in the spring. It's called, simply enough, Negotiating the New START Treaty. So uh, come out from Cambria Publishers, keep your eye open. I don't yet have a publication date, but it should be out this spring. And uh, I spent a long time thinking about what made the ratification process work in the US Senate. And all I can say to you is, well, there were a couple of factors. One is that uh, the leadership at that point, uh, the, the Senate was in the hands of the Democrats. Uh, it's hard to remember, but in 2010 it was. And uh, the leadership basically allowed everybody to vote according to their conscience. There wasn't a demand for a strict party line vote. That obviously has to be part of what, what goes on, that, that the senators are freed up to, to really judge the value for themselves of an arms control treaty. And in the case of New START, they ask a lot of questions. We answered over a thousand questions for the record, and we had uh, over 22 hearings briefings you know, in a formal sense 
but many, many, many informal meetings, sitting down with senators or their staffs in their offices, sometimes repeatedly, to answer all the questions they had about the treaty. And they did get interested. They did get involved. They did want to understand from the inside out what the treaty was all about, why it was different from the START Treaty, uh, and what the value is for US national security. So I do think if, if the senators are allowed to engage that uh, they uh, will and, and have in, in recent memory, I, I agree of course that the cadre of experts has diminished and we, we need more. I am heartened that there seem to be students in universities, Alex is among them who are interested and in asking some questions. Uh, but I will say also that I found a new start uh, the negotiations, uh, we had a delegation where a lot of people came from Washington to work uh, for uh, the OSD team and the, um, the JCS team. They'd never seen a Russian before. They were weapon system operators. They'd been down in ICBM silos. They'd you know, been working at the bomber bases or on submarines, but they were there as technical experts. They turned out to be the most natural and talented negotiators I have ever seen because they and their Russian counterparts spoke a common language, a technical language. They spoke English, the Russians spoke Russian, but they had uh, a common set of interests, common technical knowledge, and they turned out to be really good negotiators. So I think there's a, I always say, and this is getting into my comments on, on Alex's remarks that, uh, you know, it's not rocket science uh, to be a nuclear negotiator. Anybody who's had to negotiate with toddlers or teenagers knows how to get to yes with a difficult set of customers. And that included in the case of New Start, not only uh, the, Russian, uh, the Russians, but also uh, the interagency on the US side. So uh, it takes negotiation in, in all directions, uh, I must say. But, but I, I wouldn't shortchange the notion that there are, there's a lot of natural talent out there that can come uh, to the negotiating table and, and really succeed. Um, I'm also gonna take a little bit of uh, exception with your comments, Steve, about the Republicans you know, being the, the, the big winners. President Clinton uh, did get uh, both the CWC, that was slight error in, in your remarks, the Chemical Weapons Convention and the adapted CFE Treaty across the finish line uh, in, the, in the Senate. Um, and thank God we have the CWC in force now because we've had to deal with uh, Novichok, we've had to deal with, uh, with uh, the Russian attacks using this, this terrible, um, this terrible um, Novichok. Uh, but uh, it was the CTBT that failed spectacularly. And uh, that uh, indeed has continued to dog us. I am glad that the moratorium on testing remains in place, but uh, the CTBT failed spectacularly. Nevertheless, uh, Clinton did get uh, a couple of treaties across the finish line and Obama got the new START treaty across the finish line. So yeah, it's easier for the Republican presidents, but they have to be willing to do it. I give huge credit uh, to President Reagan, of course, and to, uh, and to President uh, George H.W. Bush and George W. Bush for, for being ready and willing to, to work hard on the nuclear arms control agenda. Um, one thing, yeah, Alex, it is true that there tends to be a general skepticism, not only among your students, but in, I would say, the, among the public as well, that negotiations somehow, uh, you know, that's not what he men do. Uh, they, they have military force in, <laughs> instead. But I like to point out that there is a continuum here from diplomacy to military instruments. And I like to emphasize when I talk about this, that this continuum exists and it has to exist because we have to have other problem solving mechanisms that are not instruments of war. And in fact, on a day in day out basis, it's our diplomats uh, who serve our national security purposes more in dealing with foreign powers in getting uh, solutions to problems that affect the United States, et cetera. It's not one or the other, it's a continuum. And we hope that the action, the problem solving action stays at the diplomatic end of uh, the spectrum, the continuum, rather than edging up toward crisis and, and into conflict when the military instruments have, have to be used. But um, I think the other thing I like to remember, um, and maybe this is not always satisfying, but a number of our recent secretaries of defense, including Jim Mattis and also Bob Gates always said, and 
Bob Gates was especially good at supporting and bolstering the role of diplomacy, bolstering the role of the Department of State. Uh, <laughs> the less we spend on the diplomats, the more bullets I have to buy. That's, that's the line generally. And, uh, and so uh, we are now at a moment in our history when sadly the Department of State has been uh, seriously damaged in the current administration and now has to be rebuilt, including my own former organization, the T family of bureaus, which uh, includes the Arms Control Bureau, Non-Proliferation Bureau, and also the Political Military Affairs Bureau. But that's not the only damage uh, that has been done in the Department of State, and, and that will be a huge, I know, priority for the new administration coming in and, uh, and also uh, for, um, I, I think, you know, it, it will take some good interagency cooperation to ensure that the support is there for rebuilding our diplomacy. And, but I see it in the team that is coming together. I think they will be uh, a good team, not of rivals, but a team of colleagues. Great. Thank you so much, Rose. Um, your The comments that have come up about citizen science, uh, I, I can't help but be reminded of one of my uh, current avocations, which is bird watching and, and how the amazing citizen science now that's being done specifically for birds with with millions of people contributing billions of i think probably of observations around the world uh, shows uh, in a rather different arena uh what can be done uh with uh citizen-led uh big data um if uh, any of the panelists would like to respond uh, to Rose now, let me give you that opportunity. Otherwise, we have about 20 minutes left, and I, I'd like to turn to uh, the questions that have come in from our attendees. And, and uh, not only would I like to thank uh, Rose, Kinnett, Steve, and Alex, but also uh, all of the attendees who've uh, stuck with us uh, throughout today's uh, webinar to this point. Hearing no interventions from the panel, let me turn to the first question. It's from uh, Hiroaki Nakanishi, who asks, how can the United States and Russia lead in making a new nuclear arms control architecture in a way that includes China? For instance, NATO advocates including China in a post-INF framework. How can we incentivize China to do so? Do you think that nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states, NATO and U.S. allies from in the Indo-Pacific region, do they need to push slash accommodate China to realize such a post-INF framework? In addition, if so, if yes, what kind of non-nuclear or what kind of role can uh, non-nuclear weapon states play in this? So, um, open the floor to responses okay. on that. Perhaps, uh, perhaps I'll I'll get started, and it's uh, also a way to answer. I'm going to go uh, Alex's questions about what's in it for them, because that is important, and it's. You know, no country is going to come to the negotiating table because uh, they're forced. They have to see uh, an interest, a national security interest. Uh, and uh, I think that must be part of the negotiations from one end to the other, uh, a mutual, in the end, benefit emerging from the negotiations and going into a treaty. So mutuality of benefit is really, really important. That's why I never could understand the, uh, the Trump administration's push to get China into the extended New START Treaty, because you're absolutely right, Alex. Why? Why would they be interested when they have so many fewer uh, strategic uh, nuclear weapon systems than either the United States or the Russian Federation? Many, many fewer warheads. Uh, so why would it be in their interest? I actually think INF is a, a different case because um, China, uh, like Russia, uh, has been observing a um, proliferation of intermediate range ground launch systems, highly capable systems across Eurasia. China, of course, deploys many such systems. Uh, Russia now with their new 9M729 missiles, some of which are deployed uh, east of the Urals. Uh, you know, and India, Pakistan, uh, 
and uh, as far away as Iran, uh, maybe not so much concern for, for China, but uh, bordering on it. So there, and, and North Korea, of course, as well. So very capable intermediate range weapon systems. And they are watching a circumstance now where the United States uh, is uh, beginning uh, to countenance deployment of intermediate range ground launch conventional missiles in Asia. This has been part of the Trump administration's response to the demise of uh, the INF treaty. And uh, so as a result of which the Chinese may be beginning to see uh, a reason why they might be interested in negotiating away uh, some of these capabilities uh, in the hands of others. And I think it's particularly a potent point if uh, we proceed forward with this moratorium that the Russians have proposed on intermediate range ground launch systems in uh, Europe. And that includes the whole European part of Russia, which would mean uh, if properly negotiated that the Russians would have to remove all their new shiny 9M729 missiles from European Russia and where would they take them? East of the Urals, no doubt, uh, unless uh, like the original INF treaty uh, we insisted that they destroy all those missiles. So it's a question, it's a question for negotiation, but I can see there being um, a concern and interest of the Chinese should that happen. Uh, so um, I do think in this case, there may be some reasons uh, where they would see their national interest served by beginning to negotiate. Uh, I think also uh, it's, because now, and I talk about this in the Washington Quarterly piece, we've done so much work on distinguishing conventional from non-conventional non items, conventional from nuclear items on the front ends of missiles that we could negotiate an INF treaty that would limit uh, or ban nuclear uh, INF and leave alone the conventional INF, which is where the Chinese have the preponderance of their capability. People keep saying, oh, they'll never agree to a, another INF. Well, that's because INF banned all such missiles, conventional and nuclear. We're now getting to a point we can distinguish conventional from nuclear in, a, in an on-site inspection process. And so it's possible that they could keep their conventional weapons and just uh, not have any nuclear systems, so limits placed on them. So we'll see where this goes, but it's a good way again to come back to Alex's question about uh, what's their interest, what's in it for them. There has to be something in it for them or they'll never come to the table. Thanks, Rose. There are a number of other questions I'd like to get to, but if anyone else on the panel would like to respond to that first question, please feel free to do so. All right, uh, let's move on. An anonymous attendee asks, any comments on the role of the private sector slash industry also in relation to trust in science? Somebody else like to take that one on? I'm happy to as well, but. Well, why don't I get started? All right. Uh, I'll get started anyway. Um, I, uh, I really do believe that we need, uh, as indicated in my remarks, backed up by what Kinnett had to say, that, that we need to be thinking uh, more um, imaginatively about public-private partnership. Uh, for example, I mentioned the co commercially launched uh, satellite constellations that are up there now, and the notion of national technical means. A national technical means they were always those big satellites with very you know, expensive, heavy and sophisticated for their age, uh, sensors on them, uh, cameras and, and so forth. And uh, some such sensors also on aircraft, uh, sometimes over the horizon radar capabilities. These are national technical means always historically owned by the national governments. Okay, now we need to rethink, as I said, and, and bring to bear more of this ubiquitous sensing capability uh, the ability to photograph the surface of the earth every day, the whole surface of the earth every day, which is emerging into reality now. But these kinds of capabilities are controlled uh, by, uh, by commercial uh, interests, by commercial companies. So how do we bring together these notions of national technical means and non-interference with national technical means 
with the notion that now we have commercial players in this area. And I do think, again, I don't have the perfect answer at this moment. Clearly there's been some good experience so far with groups like 38 North uh, and Bellingcat using of commercially available satellite imagery uh, to do their own analyses. They have different kinds of relationships as I've understood it with these commercial companies, uh, sometimes just buying the, the photographs, sometimes other arrangements are in place. So what can we learn from this? And does it make sense now for there to be a closer partnership between government, uh, the governments and uh, the commercial companies in this particular area of national technical means used for monitoring purposes in arms control non-proliferation agreements. I know there are already relationships out there. They work together in, in many uh, arenas, but in this particular area, I think it's high time. So yes, we have some work to do, but how do we develop this notion of public-private partnership to serve uh, policy in the realm of arms control and non-proliferation? Let me go on to the next question. Could Rose and the other panelists discuss, the, and this comes from Bill Colglazer, a member of our uh, organizing committee for the symposium. Could Rose and the other panelists please discuss the role of the uh, Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty and the impact of hypersonic weapons and autonomous weapons? Rose, you want to kick that off? <laughs> <laughs> That's worth a whole symposium just by itself, John. So, okay. <laughs> I mean, each of those, each of those topics. Um, I will say about the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, as, as I noted, it has had an enormous, I would say, normative effect and in bolstering the existing moratorium on testing that has been uh, successful. The only country that has tested this century has been North Korea, the DPRK, and now they too have stepped back, at least for the moment, from an active testing program. So the, I think the CTBT, despite the fact that it has not uh, entered into force, is serving a very important role. And I will underscore the role of the CTBTO and, uh, and the activities that they undertake in terms of gathering enormous amounts of seismic data, uh, enormous amounts of data, and, uh, and providing confidence that these data are uh, not uh, pursuant to uh, explosive nuclear testing, but naturally occurring events. And so I think, you know, despite the fact that the treaty is not in force, uh, it has been and will continue to play an important role. And by the way, the CTBTO does a great amount of work on developing uh, the technologies of verification, increasing their sophistication, increasing their capability. And I think that that too must continue so we get better and better um, confidence uh, in uh, the fact that no country is uh, is pursuing explosive testing of, of nuclear weapons. Uh, hypersonic systems, uh, you know, we're still getting our arms around the effect of these. That is one of the reasons why I'm calling uh, in my in my paper to to think hard and long about what the future will bring because we are coming to an era where, you know, we know how to control the big hardware. We've done that. We know how to control ballistic missiles, bombers, submarines, fine. That's great. Now, what about the smaller units of account, the warheads? Okay, we're on the cusp, I think, of grappling with that problem and finally, and finally tackling it and uh, beginning to directly limit warheads. But what about the ephemeral of effects of some of these new technologies. Now, HGVs, I think they come under the realm of big hardware. And in fact, the Russians have already established a useful precedent here by saying that they will bring uh, the avant-garde system uh, under the accountability of the, the New START Treaty. So that's good. Their HGV, nuclear armed, will come into accountability in the New START Treaty. So that's a useful precedent. We need to be thinking, I think, further about about what about conventionally armed HGVs, which is uh, the US system. Uh, how, how do we control them? They can be controlled by similar mechanisms uh, as the limits of, of New START, but will we be willing to do so? So those are some questions. What really worries me are um, you know, the interplay 
uh, between our strategic nuclear weapons systems and uh, the capabilities developing in the cyber realm. And here, uh, I know a lot of people are concerned. I'm concerned about the ability to meddle with national command authorities uh, and also with, um, uh, with our uh, warning capabilities uh, if uh, a, an adversary can get inside our, uh, our cyber systems. So these are questions that we have barely touched in trying to uh, develop, you know, again, some, some normative infrastructure, some non-interference infrastructure, you know, simplest things. We haven't really gotten there yet. And this is where I think we need to do a great deal of work uh, as soon as possible. Thanks, Rose. We have about five minutes left in our Q&A, and at this point I'm going to have to condense uh, several questions into one, I think, uh, or maybe two more uh, in the interest of time. A question uh, in directed in part to, to Steve Miller, uh, how can international society, international civil society, increase or enhance the compliance, trust, or credibility of any arms control architectures? What kind of step is required to restore those elements and avoid arms control skepticism? Keep developing or catching up uh, with technological advances. The significance of science, as mentioned, is, only a pan is it only a panacea, or are there other elements or approaches that should be considered an inclusive and democratic method, bipartisan support, or political leadership? So rather open-ended question, but Steve, I wonder if you've got some thoughts on that. Well, uh, in the course of her essay, Rose uh, notes that arms control is always controversial. Uh, and, uh, you know, th there's an old uh, aphorism about arms control being an unnatural act because it involves, at least bilateral arms control, usually involves trying to negotiate your own security with your rival or adversary. And that's uh, inevitably a, a sensitive uh, process. Uh, and so uh, skepticism and opposition are a normal part of the exercise of, of arms control. Uh, and uh, then this uh, intersects with another portion of our conversation here, which is uh, we have certain objectives that we're trying to achieve in arms control that we believe will advantage our security, uh, enhance our well-being in the international context. Uh, but in order to uh, get such outcomes, you have to give something to the other side unless you're having a coerced outcome. Bargaining inevitably involves giving and getting. Uh, and uh, then the question is, did you get enough? Did you give too much? Did you get too little for what you gave? Uh, these are all uh, political and strategic uh, judgments on which there's often significant uh, disagreement. Uh, and uh, you can see this very much in, for example, the Iran uh, nuclear deal. The critics basically said, Kerry and Obama wanted a deal so badly that they gave up too much and got too little and they had this enormous leverage and they didn't use it to uh, really uh, rein in this, uh, Iran's program as much as possible and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, the question that uh, this person has asked is basically boils down to how do you win that argument? And I think uh, Rose gave us uh, the answer, which is that you have to explain and defend uh, uh, the outcome uh, in the context of implications for uh, American security. And uh, often it boils down to, as in the Iran case, are we better off with a constrained or an unconstrained Iranian nuclear program? <laughs> uh, that I think ultimately was the choice. And you can say, well, we should, should have aimed for more constraints or less constraints, you know, more, more constraints or longer term constraints or whatever. But you can only, uh, as Bob Gallucci has often said, uh, the other side has a voice and a vote uh, and you can only achieve what the other side is willing to agree to uh, and at some point you may feel like you've gotten as much as you can get. And then the question is, can you persuade, you know, a majority in your own community and your own political system uh, 
uh, to buttress that uh, and support that that outcome. Uh, in my experience, the the role of the public is often permissive, often inert, uh, often uh, ignored or rejected by the by the political class. So there's a complicated story there to tell to tell there. Uh, but uh, to my mind, the uh, the decisive action is likely to be more often people like Rose in rooms of small uh, numbers of relevant people <laughs> persuading them of the wisdom and merit of the outcome uh, than it is uh, uh, out there in the great wider public. Uh, I, I'm actually involved uh, as the lead briefer in an American Academy of Arts and Sciences program uh, that uh, has over the last year, year and a half, been uh, focused on briefing uh, congressional staff on uh, nuclear arms control issues. And we've done about a dozen different uh, briefings, including of all the relevant committees and so on. This is just background information. Uh, so I've had a lot of, spent a lot of time on the Hill, nothing like Rose in many ways, but uh, one of the things you discover is there are a lot of earnest, young, enthusiastic people on congressional staffs who've never dealt with nuclear issues, uh, who've never participated in past ratification processes, uh, who haven't uh, trained or become expert on nuclear uh, issues, but who are nevertheless the foreign policy or defense policy person in some house office. And those are the people who are going to be briefing the boss. And uh, there, I think, uh, is an example of where uh, Rose's commitment to education really makes makes a difference. Thank thank you very much, Steve. I I'm afraid we're out of time. We have a few more questions that we weren't able to get to, and for that, uh, my apologies to our attendees. Um, I've I've actually copied down the questions, so there may be an opportunity for us to distribute those offline after the after the webinar. There was also, Rose, a request for more information uh, regarding your forthcoming book. And I think what we'd like to do with your permission is once there is a website, uh, promotional website available, we'll go ahead and forward that as well to those who attended uh, today. Um, and with that, uh, again, uh, my thanks to our uh, presenter and our discussants uh, for what's been uh, remarkably rich and, and informative. Uh, engaging uh, set of comments today, and I will turn things back over uh, to Gerson. Well, wow, thank you. Thank you, all of our participants. Uh, thank you for your to viewers for st sticking with this, uh, kind of hard not to. And um, our special gratitude goes out to Rose Gottmuller for her talk, which just couldn't be more important today and which I hope will serve as a widely referenced source for US policy, and not only going forward. Note that we have some Russian viewers today. Perhaps they will also see value in Rose's deeply informed remarks and prescriptions, as well as the excellent points made by the discussants. This has been a very open discussion with a lot of provocative thinking, and I think we've all learned much from it. Uh, this webinar has been recorded and it will be available on the CRDF Global website in short order. I'd like to remind you as I started out, we're interested in hearing about new webinar topics. We've seen our memorial seminars ability to stimulate forward looking discussion on topics international, uh, central to international scientific cooperation. A couple that have been mentioned here today are intersection between uh, climate and arms control, and even the role of hypersonic weapons. In this uh, safe space, we can be ambitious and explore some of the really big questions. I also want to remind you about the award competition, uh, young scientists, uh, young leaders in international scientific cooperation uh, to really honor Vic's memory we must think and act on engaging the next generations. And I'm so glad that uh, we had discussion and participation from Alex Wellerstein and others 
uh, in, in, in this discussion. Thank you so much. So in conclusion, you see the image behind me. It was a casual photo I took when walking past the Capitol one evening uh, a couple of years ago on the way to the theater. The contrast between its serenity and the ongoing events in the United States could not be more disturbing. It's clear, I believe, to all who are online today that xenophobia, isolation, not to mention the resort to violence to resolve conflict, are not the path of the world in which we wish to live. But these evils will not go away on their own, pardon the little lecture. The world we want will not happen by itself. If there's one lesson of these seminars, and it was alluded to actually, Steve Miller, thank you very much in your final remarks, and of Vic Rabinowitz's memory, it's that we must engage in positive, imaginative, bold, affirming action to promote all the views and hopes we cherish. And it is that international scientific cooperation is on the critical path to that goal. Thank you, that concludes this webinar, but not our series going forward and sure isn't the last word on any of these topics. Uh, thank you, be safe, be, safe, be well, uh, and let us pray for peace and tranquility in our country and in the world.